Over recent decades, Spain has been one of those countries that has always spent much more than it has earned. Spain is a country that, when it has a problem, instead of solving it, has preferred to defer it and pretend it did not exist. In short, Spain has been a state that has dodged all of its obstacles by indebting its future generations for life. And that, I'm afraid, has consequences. Spain, leading the European Union in deficit and debt, the most vulnerable due to the Ukraine crisis. After many years of bread and circuses, Spain, along with other southern European countries, could be about to face a bankruptcy in their public accounts. What this means in a nutshell is that governments could run out of money to pay for hospitals, pensions, and even their country's outstanding debts. But take note, because although this may seem to be just a political problem, something that could be resolved by slashing public accounts and adjusting expenses accordingly, the truth is that, as we will explain, bankruptcy could end up trans translating into a huge international financial crisis, an economic recession perfectly comparable to that of 2008. And as if that were not enough, in the worst case scenario, it could even mean the end of the euro as we know it. And no, we are not exaggerating. This is not the first time that bankruptcy fears have hit old Europe and the stability of the euro. Euro crisis 2.0. Debt burdens could return to 2011 levels if rates rise much further, Deutsche Bank strategist warns. Knowing all of this, I think the questions we have to ask in this video are clear. Why could Spain and Southern Europe be in danger of bankruptcy? Why are the alarms only going off now and not much earlier? What has brought the country to this point? And above all, is there any reasonable solution for avoiding disaster? Today on Visual Economic, we answer these questions. Listen up. As we saw a moment ago, the 2008 crisis was a turning point in the stability of Spain and the Eurozone. You could say it was the beginning of all of the problems they're about to face once again. Before the arrival of 2008, the debt and public spending of European countries was something that no one was particularly bothered about. At that time, things were going well. The countries that had been economically backward until the 1980s had managed to turn things around. And in short, you could say that money was growing on trees. Without digging too deeply, in the Spain of 2007, public debt stood at a derisory 35% 0.8%, which, to give you a comparison, was practically four times less than the current figure. And that wasn't the best part. The best was that future prospects were also phenomenal. Between 2005 and 2007, the government had managed to bring in about 20 billion euros, or 21.5 billion US dollars, more each year than it could spend, resulting in a surplus of about 2% of GDP. In other words, there was plenty of money to spare, which, as you can imagine, ended up being channeled into huge wastes of money and megalithic public works that were totally unnecessary, like, for example, this airport where construction began in 2004 and that did not receive a single airplane for several years. But that's a topic for another the video. In any case, the Bonanza era came to an end. As you all know, the real estate boom affected the Spanish economy enormously and the government started to run out of money. While in 2007 the government took in 20 billion euros more than it was able to spend, in 2009 the government spent a whopping 120 billion. That's just under 129 billion US dollars more than it was able to take in. In other words, in able to maintain the expenses generated in the boom times, the government began to spend more than it had during the crisis. It started to get into debt. And you will probably say, well, if the government spent a lot when there was a lot of money, wouldn't it make sense that after the crisis, when there was less money, it would have cut back? Well, the thing is that if Spanish public spending policies has been characterized by one thing in recent years, it is for being completely detached from economic reality. To give you an example, while during the 2008 crisis, the rate of job destruction in the private sector reached 10% per year, the public sector hired 150,000 new public employees. Of course, their salaries would be paid for via more and more debt. While in 2005, spending on public employees in Spain was around 7.9% of GDP, today this percentage is 11.7%. So just as I said earlier, kick the problems along the road and pass them on to future generations. In any case, this might not be bad at all if the economy had grown, but the Spanish economy has been completely stagnant since then. On one hand, they have a shrinking economy, and on the other, they have a government that spends more and more. Not surprisingly, this led to the Spanish public debt more than doubling between 2008 and 2012. Now let me ask you one thing. If you were an investor in 2012 and you had to lend money to a state, 
Would you lend it to countries like Spain, Greece, or Italy, where the economic crisis destroyed a large part of their economy, where public debt kept growing, and where future prospects were completely negative? I mean, if a country spends and spends and spends and spends, and it never gets any revenue, when is it supposed to pay you back? It's almost like giving a money to a person addicted to gambling. Nothing good can come of it. That is why, at the peak of economic tension in 2012, the governments of Southern Europe were faced with the fear that no one would want to buy their debt anymore. And if no one bought their debt, not only would they not be able to pay for hospitals and pensions, but as we will explain, the euro as a European currency could even end in bankruptcy. Now, do you think that the European Central Bank was going to allow that to happen? Well, no. The ECB is ready to do whatever it takes to preserve the euro. The European Central Bank, ECB, said on Sunday that it will implement its public debt purchasing program, implying that it could buy sovereign debt from Spain and Italy on Monday to avoid contagion from the crises to these countries. Fearing that no one would want to lend money to southern European countries, and that this could cause their economies to collapse, which in turn could mean the end of the euro, the European Central Bank announced that it would do everything in its power to prevent this. And since we're talking about a central bank, this eventually meant printing money and buying lots of Spanish debt. In short, that's what saved the euro in 20. 12, central bank support. But unfortunately, it was also the beginning of the huge problems we are facing in 2022, which we will explain in this video. So the question is, what are these serious current problems? Well, visual economic fans, let's continue with the story. Feast today, famine tomorrow. In 2015, the financial crisis finally came to an end. Recovery had reached the countries of Europe and governments started to bring in more money. Fears of bankruptcy and the end of the euro were finally behind us. However, Spain and the rest of the southern countries faced a new challenge. Before a new crisis arrived, because you know that the economy is a cycle of crises and booms, the Spanish government had to get its act together, cut expenses, and adjust the accounts in order to be able to save and be prepared for the future. That was the plan, and it made sense. Think about it. Unlike in 2008, if a new crisis were to occur, Spain and the rest of the countries would now have more than 100% public debt. In other words, in a new crisis, the danger of bankruptcy would be even greater than it had been in 2012. In other words, in a new crisis, the danger of bankruptcy would be even greater than it had been in 2012. So now, the question is, after the return to a new period of bonanza in 2015, did Spain manage to adjust and strengthen its public accounts? At first glance, it might seem so. In this graph, you can see how from 2014 to 2019, Spanish public debt fell from 105% to 98%. Anyone would think that the Spanish government took the bull by the horns, that politicians abandoned their wasteful maneuvers and got very serious about adjusting the national accounts. Surprise! Do you think that Spain did everything wrong? Well, relax, because this chart is actually a bit deceptive. Let me explain. Despite the fact that public debt as a percentage of GDP was falling every year, the Spanish government was still spending much more money than it had. And you may ask, if the debt was lower, how is it possible for the government to spend more than it has? Well, because the formula for calculating the debt percentage divides the total debt by the GDP, so that even if the debt increases, if the GDP increases even more, the percentage ends up being lower. In other words, the Spanish government once again took the advantage of the boom period to continue getting into debt, while the data were being improved thanks to economic growth. You know, when the economy grows in Spain, more money is spent. And when it decreases again, that money is not reduced. Conclusion, that since the coronavirus crisis arrived, the following has happened. Bank of Spain confirms an even higher public debt record, 120% of GDP, 1.34 trillion euros. When the new recession hit, the debt skyrocketed just as it had in 2008, as a result of the huge public deficit. To be specific, Spain's primary balance, that is what is earned minus what is spent, excluding interest payments, has averaged negative 2.58% over the last six years. Now, is this deficit too high or too low? Well, given the current conditions with a debt of 120%, Assuming an optimistic economic growth of 1% per year, remember that Spain has been stagnant since 2005, and an average interest rate of 1.5%, keep this second figure in mind, 1.5%, we could say that Spain would need to increase its primary balance by 3% of GDP to be able to pay its debt in a sustainable way. In other words, if Spain does not achieve that 3% of GDP in extra primary balance, it will be doomed to bankruptcy. So raising 3% of GDP would basically mean raising taxes by 7.5%, or else, cut 
cutting spending by the same amount. Are you beginning to see the danger of all this? Well, hold on to your chair because there is still much more. Above all, there is a key question that we have not answered. Why now? I mean, Spain has been running a deficit and 120% debt since 2020. What is the reason the bankruptcy alarms have only just gone off in 2022? Check out this piece of news. The ECB prepares to end its debt purchases in the summer due to runaway inflation. The institution highlights the serious deterioration in businesses and consumer confidence and the rise in prices. Since the European Central Bank's debt began buying in 2012, it has just kept growing. That Spain has been able to incur so much debt to date has been because the central bank has continued buying its debt. In particular, we're talking about the fact that almost 40% of all Spain's debt has been acquired by the European Central Bank in recent years. And remember, if we told you to keep the 1.5% in mind. Assuming an optimistic economic growth of 1% per year, remember that Spain has been stagnant since 2005, and an average interest rate of 1.5%, keep this second figure in mind, 1.5%, we could say that Spain would need to increase its primary balance by 3% of GDP to be able to pay its debt in a sustainable way. Well, Spain paying 1.5% interest on its debt is a complete anomaly. An anomaly that has been allowed thanks to the injections of cheap money from the European Central Bank. But of course, as we've seen in the news, after the runaway inflation in the Eurozone, the ECB has decided to put an end to these massive injections of money, which means that it will be much more expensive for Spain to get into debt and manage its current debt. But how much exactly are we talking about? How much will it cost Spain to get into debt from now on? Well, if we take into account what the debt cost Spain before the central bank started flooding it with cheap money, We could say that in the best case scenario, the average interest rate could go up to 3.5%. So it would no longer be enough, nor will it be enough for Spain to increase its primary balance by 3% of GDP, but it would have to increase it to at least 5.5%. Translating this back into revenue, Spain would have to raise taxes or cut expenses by at least 13.75% in the next few years. Does this sound serious enough for you? I'm sure it does, but relax. Let's not go so fast because the worst part is yet to come. And no, I'm not being an alarmist. Sanchez plans to raise pension spending by 6.1% of GDP in 2050. Spain, like countries such as Japan, has a rapidly aging population. For instance, it is estimated that by 2050, there could be six pensioners for every four people of working age. And take note, these are people of working age, not necessarily workers. If we look at workers, in 25 to 30 years time, there will be around two pensioners for every active worker in Spain. And be careful because the data we have seen so far, which say that Spain needs to increase its revenue by almost 14% in order to avoid bankruptcy are based on the assumption that public spending will not change. But of course, with a rapidly aging population, these costs are likely to skyrocket. And you may be wondering, but how much will the aging population increase public spending? According to the most optimistic calculations, calculations offered by the government itself, if we take into account an economic growth of over 1% of GDP, which as we have already seen is not the case, Spain would need at least 8% of its gross domestic product each year for pensions, healthcare costs, and aid for dependency. If we add this 8% to the 5.5% increase in the primary balance that we need to make the current debt sustainable, we get the whopping figure that Spain will need an additional 13.5% of GDP in order to be able to pay its debts. That is, they would need at least that much. In other words, 34% more revenue. And this, of course, is assuming three very optimistic conditions. One, that tax increases do not affect the economy and it grows at 1% per year on average almost miraculously. Two, that life expectancy does not increase more than expected, worsening the cost of demographic aging. Three, that the optimistic interest rates of 3.5% are not actually going to be much higher than that. In short, if any of these three conditions are not met, the cost for Spain will be much higher than the calculation we have just presented. This is an optimistic calculation that leads us to believe that Spain is irrevocably facing bankruptcy. Now, why is bankruptcy the most likely option? What are the consequences and can it be avoided? Well, let's take a look. Hunger is here. 
If Spain does not manage to balance its accounts, if it maintains constant deficits, one thing is clear, investors will stop lending it money. You know, nobody lends money to someone who only knows how to spend. If this happens, Spain will no longer be able to maintain its fiscal structure, which means two things. Either it cuts its public spending, particularly on pensions and the welfare state, or it defaults on its public debts, or it massively increases taxes. On the one hand, the option of increasing taxes by the amounts we have seen would be difficult to achieve without seriously affecting economic activity and the welfare of families, making growth disappear, which, as we have seen, is essential in order to be able to address the shortfalls in public accounts. On the other hand, cutting spending seems an even more complicated task. This is because, once again, by 2050, there will be six pensioners for every four people of working age. Living in a democratic system, in order to cut old age spending, pensioners would have to vote against themselves. They would have to vote for a cut in pensions, which, to be honest, does not seem particularly feasible. So the last option would be to simply default, not pay the debt, that is, to go bankrupt. This is an option that some populist political parties are proposing, and one that became especially relevant when it was raised back in 2015 during the worst era. Podemos proposes a general default on public debt. Now, what would a bankruptcy of the Spanish state and potentially of the rest of the southern European countries that are in very similar situations imply? Aren't there more alternative solutions than the one we've proposed in this video? In answer to the first question, a massive debt default could lead directly to the end of the euro. Yes, that's right. But not only that, it could also lead to a financial crisis never before seen in recent European history, including the collapse of banks and the loss of savings of many families. Why, you may ask, and how would would the bankruptcy of Southern Europe translate in such a situation? Well, that's what we will talk about in the second part of this video, a second part that we will upload next week. You can check it in the description if it has already been uploaded. In addition, we will discuss possible alternative solutions to the Spanish debt crisis that we have not covered in this video. So now, it's your turn. Did you know that Spain was in such bad shape financially? How would you escape from this debt and public spending problem? As always, you can leave your answers in the comments, use the thank you button to highlight your opinions as well as support the channel, and if you liked the video, Video, hit the bell, like it, and if you're not yet subscribed, subscribe. Take care, and I'll see you next time.